So what we're dealing with is tremendous uncertainty about what comes next. And, um, and so what we can do is learn more effective strategies for coping with uncertainty than we come by naturally in terms of how we're kind of hardwired to deal with it. The opposite of uncertainty is not certainty, right? We tend to pursue certainty when we feel uncertain. We want to know the black or white answer to what's coming next. And the opposite of uncertainty is presence, right? It is being present to whatever is there for us. Good evening and welcome to your library. I'm David Leonard, president of the Boston Public Library and host and moderator of our conversation this evening. And so for those of you joining us in person, welcome to the Abbey Room here in the McKim Building of the Central Library in Copley Square. And to those joining us online, we'll have you present with us virtually as well. Uh, we're trying a slightly new format this evening with this uh, mixed audience, a hybrid audience, if you will, some of you here in person and some of you participating online. When it comes to the question and answer section, we will be taking questions from the audience. We'll have one of our staff members walking around with a microphone. And for those of you joining us online live, we'll also be able to take questions from the online audience with uh, Kristen, who's going to act as our liaison to the online community here in person. Uh, tonight's program is the second in our Lowell Lecture Series for this spring. And our theme um, for this series is equity, hope, and healing. Uh, and so we look forward to engaging in the conversation with our guest tonight. Uh, my thanks go to the Lowell Institute, our partners at the GBH Forum Network, and our staff here at the BPL, who have together uh, facilitated tonight's um, program. Um, a few other logistical pieces of information. We have an on-site bookseller partner in Poseman Books, who are located on Newbury Street, and will be here for a small book signing for those of you who would like after the program. Uh, we will be encouraging uh, those joining us online to check out their local libraries or independent bookstores, or go to bookshop.org for additional information. And so um, I would now like to turn to introduce my guest this evening, uh, Dr. Christine Carter. Uh, she is an author, speaker, and coach. Her books include The New Adolescence, Raising Happy and Successful Teens in an Age of Anxiety and Distraction, The Sweet Spot, How to Achieve More by Doing Less, and Raising Happiness, 10 Simple Steps to More Joyful Kids and Happier Parents. Um, she's a graduate of Dartmouth College and the recipient of multiple honors and awards. After completing her master's and doctoral degrees in sociology at UC Berkeley, Dr. Carter was recruited to lead the Greater Good Science Center as the executive director. In 2014, she hired a new executive director so that she could pursue her writing, speaking, and coaching career full time. She remains a sociologist and senior fellow at UC Berkeley. She's appeared on many uh, of the television shows, such as The Oprah Winfrey Show, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, and news programs, including ABC World News with Diane Sawyer, for example. Uh, she writes a monthly advice column for Greater Good Magazine uh, and contributes to several other outlets as well. Um, and tonight's conversation, she will, I think, combine scientific research, practical applications, and offer us and her clients, readers, and audiences not only a way to cope with modern pressures, but tactics to truly thrive. Dr. Carter, Christine, welcome. Please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Carter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're doing this in person, live. Um, <laughs> how does that feel, and what's that like? I am, I am so thrilled to be here. Thank I am you. so so happy to be here and I you know it's funny because I was reflecting on before the shutdown um, honestly I was tired and burned out and traveling all the time to give talks and um, g getting a little whiny about my lifestyle and now I 
I'm just so thrilled to be back. I can appreciate um, the power of being in person and the magic of being in a library like this. I was, I was really like moved walking in. And I'm also really thrilled that we have an audience online, that there's an accessibility here um, that there wasn't before, that this is a major improvement. And I also really love being in conversation, which is something that happened in a lot of places when we were only virtual. And I'm so happy to ha be in conversation with you here. Well, 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 thank you for joining us. I mean, I, I, we're, it's a kind of an experiment for us as well to continue what worked well about the online experience and move it to the in-person, hopefully keep the best of both. Yeah. Um, and we're living in, in a world that is uh, post-COVID and a world that is facing major, major challenges. Yeah. Um, so to talk about happiness and hope in that context, um, I think uh, I think will be interesting yeah. and um, you know perhaps a little bit challenging. But uh, but I'd like to get to know you a little bit better before before we do that. So um, your your early career was, was this always something that you were uh, you know expected to be doing? You know, an expert on humanity, really, uh, how to talk to kids, teenagers, and making happy adults. Yeah, no, no, I don't think that it was always something, but I've, I have always been really, really interested in the human condition. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I come from a long line of anxious women on both sides of the family tree. And um, it really, for me, became salient when I was pregnant with my first okay. child because I thought, you know, uh, I think we've got this happiness thing figured out. Like, from a science standpoint, oh. I was already starting to study it a little bit. and. Um, I, I, I want to know, you know, my kids aren't going to necessarily inherit good genetics on the <laughs> happiness front um, from me necessarily, but what, what's within our control, yeah. right? What can we, um, what can I in particular do as a parent? Mm -hmm. You know, I started, I became a sociologist because I wanted to look at social structures, so families and workplaces and, mm -hmm. um, Communities, how can we influence mm. um, our emotions, mm. essentially, and the emotions of those around us? Mm. You know, most parents know that you can't really tell your children how to feel, um, but I... You shouldn't feel that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't recommend that. Uh, doesn't work out very well all the times I've tried. Um, but so, you know, I, I, I have found great joy actually in just understanding how, how we cope and how we can help others um, suffer less. Well, maybe let's start a little bit with your, your first book, which is really documenting, I think, um, some wonderful but equally painful and insightful <laughs> stories about raising young children. Um, are there a couple of favorite stories you'd like to reference from that? Um, work and you, you have four, four kids, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because when I think about raising happiness, I mean, I wrote it so long ago. My oldest were very little. Um, and uh, I really was totally keyed to happiness, right? Like I thought that was the, the end all be all. Mm. was like if I could just raise happy children, um, then I would have succeeded in that realm. And I clearly needed to write a book about it to instruct myself how to do that, right? Like I knew the science related to it. And so one of the things I remember most distinctly, which was a sort of a foreshadowing, um, one of my wise children. So you can imagine being a child of a parent who's written a book called Raising Happiness it, and living in a small town, right? Like it's... Uh, it, it, it was a mixed experience, I think, <laughs> at best for them. And so people would always ask my children if they were happy constantly, grocery store, like, are you happy, are you happy? And I remember when Fiona was eight, she, somebody said, so, you got to tell us the truth. Are you happy? And she said, I actually don't think happiness is the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, for me, it was really a moment because, to be totally honest, mm. I had, not, I had not challenged myself in that way. Like, she did not get that view from me. Um, and uh, it's, it's plain as day to me now, right? Like, I learned it from an eight-year-old. Mm. Happiness is 
not at all the most important thing. Okay. It's not even a goal I recommend. So, so, so I'm I'm picturing little kids that are doing a lot of eye rolling or um, you know <laughs> being put that. on the spot, and um, I'm also picturing the fact that uh, although. I don't have kids. I'm the oldest of my cousins. I watched many, many of my younger, younger cousins grow up. Um, I, I've seen um, other members of my extended friends, you know, have have younger kids. And it, if there's one thing you could predict, they're always going to do the very opposite of what parents expect. And it sounds like, with respect to this happiness uh, question, which I'm going to come back to in a second, that's exactly what was happening with uh, with Fiona. Yeah, you know, she was just deep. Right? And so to me now, I, I, I mean, I think she probably could have told you then, although I don't know. I don't remember the follow up question to like, well, what is the most important thing? Right. I, I mean, for her, she, lead, she leads a very meaningful life yeah. now. And I would say all of my kids do, for sure. Yeah. The youngest is now 19, which makes right. me feel really old. So, you know, I, I, think, I think that. Um, I, I feel fortunate that was always a fear that my kids would, the opposite of happiness is, is of course unhappiness or something along those lines. So I wouldn't say that. I would say though that they're, they have a lot of meaning in their lives. So if it's not happiness, it's meaning. Is that, is yeah, that where we're I, I, that, is, that is to me, I think that we've seen that in the last couple of years yeah. too. Meaning is a, um, it's a more fruitful goal to pursue. You know, mm -hmm. fortunately, happiness tends to, fo to follow meaning, mm -hmm. um, but meaning is longer lasting, mm -hmm. and um, it's a deeper thing. You know, meaning, when we have it in our lives, mm -hmm. it, will, it will carry us through the difficult times. Mm -hmm. um, and life is difficult, mm -hmm. as we've seen, mm -hmm. no matter who we are. Mm -hmm. So it, it brings us happiness in good times and resilience, in bad times. So, so. meaning, purpose, yeah. those kind of uh, yeah. goals. Like really like being in integrity with the things that matter yeah. to you, the things that you care about. Meaning comes from, um, ironically, it's really outside of ourselves, right? Like that it comes from a connection to mm -hmm. something larger than your small self. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and that is why it, is a better foundation um, for us. There, you know, there are really interesting studies that have been done mm. on um, people. So most people who have meaning also have happiness. The interesting studies come from the people who have meaning but no happiness, mm. or happiness but no meaning. Mm. And the happiness but no meaning crowd um, tends to, they also are described as being more narcissistic, more self-centered, shallow, yeah. and the happiness tends to be short-term, mm -hmm. right? It's more associated with pleasure, which mm -hmm. is an interesting thing for us to talk about. And the meaning with no happiness tends to be this really interesting case that the no happiness piece tends to be um, fleeting as well, right? Mm -hmm. The happiness comes and goes. But it doesn't seem to matter as much because the difficulty can come um, and the meaning becomes in service of something larger, right? So, um, is. So, no. self sacrifice, um, times of war perhaps, are, exactly. uh, can exactly. produce those moments of meaning, uh, which are different than the fleeting feeling of happiness. Exactly, so. exactly. I really think that. Um, in the U.S. today, in Western culture at yeah. large, we tend to really conflate pleasure and happiness or gratification and happiness. Yeah. And so from a scientific standpoint, you know, happiness is a positive emotion like joy or contentment or gratitude or something like that. But that's not really what we tend to pursue. We're not really pursuing mm -hmm. those, like a, a diversity of positive emotions, We're, we tend to pursue reward, right? And that's very different in the human brain and the human body. Activating the, the reward system mm -hmm. tends to give us that nice little hit of dopamine that we're after. And dopamine's function actually is to create craving mm -hmm. or desire. Mm -hmm. It motivates us for mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. but it also leaves us wanting more, right? And that is, craving is not, a positive emotion. 
Um, and you know, so when we pers so when we pers say we're pursuing happiness, if what we're actually pursuing is gratification or pleasure, mm. it's just not going to work. Right. It's a dopamine high that we're going for, rather than something external that's causing mm. those feelings. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a very strong insight. Um, uh, is that something that? And I think from your books, the answer is going to be yes, um, that you can talk to children and teenagers about. Because I, I think at a, at a young age, we're, we're very motivated by what you want or what you need. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, what you've just described to me as a much higher level experience of looking for, for meaning or purpose. And maybe there's happiness as a byproduct of it, but not necessarily. Yeah, and really, you know, I think that in our child rearing, culturally, we become very focused on our wanting our children to be yeah. happy and wanting them to be comfortable. And as we've seen in the last couple of years, um, that's not always available to yeah. us, right? right. And right. learning how to be uncomfortable is, is a really important mm -hmm. skill set. And so trying to find meaning and difficulty is absolutely something that we can talk about with our kids. Mm -hmm. I mean... I learned it from my daughter when she was eight, right? So this is something that they, um, they, can, they can really access. A lot of times we just have to ask them, you know, what matters to you? What do you care about? Mm -hmm. And that, so there's kind, of, there's kind of three questions that I like to talk to, like anybody, not just yeah. children or teenagers, but you know, what matters to you? What do you really care about? What do you just intrinsically feel motivated towards mm -hmm. that is larger than yourself? Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and then you know what's what special skills do you have? Right, what what is your superpower? What is like the thing that you like to do, or the skill that you would like to hone in yourself? And then and then how can you combine those two things to be in service to others, mm -hmm. to make the world a better place? Mm -hmm. And that tends to open up a very different thing, type of activity to pursue mm -hmm. than you know what would make you happy, what would make you comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, so much of our society is not geared to those kind of conversations. It's geared towards the material, the um, uh, short-term solution, the fleeting happiness. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a recipe for how we do more of the kind of behaviors that allow for a broader understanding? I do not have a recipe. Uh but I bet I can come up with one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, I just think it's, it's really being clear within yourself yeah. what, when you're being motivated by something outside of extrinsic, yeah. power, status, money, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. accomplishment, right? Success, success traditionally defined. Mm -hmm. Those, and even happiness and gratification when it's, when it's a, the pursuit of an external reward you know, shopping or um, a really fancy meal or something along those lines, mm -hmm. right? So that's one realm. Mm -hmm. It will leave you wanting more. Eventually, that can really reliably produce mm -hmm. the experience of craving. And so know that when you're pursuing that next cute pair of shoes, what you're pursuing is craving, ultimately, or what you're drive fostering in yourself hmm. is that down the line. And that there's a whole other set of inner experiences that we can access hmm. um, when we foster any positive emotion, any true positive emotion. So thinking about um, Emotions like awe or elevation or inspiration, those are kind of my favorites. And people watching these sorts of lectures tend to be, you know, better able mm. to foster them because you're, you're out here looking for elevation or inspiration or cu satisfying curiosity or something like that. Like that's, that's going to much more reliably produce a positive emotion in your life to foster that is not going to have any negative consequences um, and over so the long term. Do we trace that to other brain activity? or the Yeah. Way? So yes. what's the contrast there? Uh, well, 
Technically speaking, there is a fair amount of overlap, but what you get, you get brain activation and nervous system activation in different, in different ways. So all of our emotions have functions and we tend to be more, and they produce physiological responses, right? And so we tend to be more familiar with the physiological response that comes from our difficult emotions like anxiety or anger or whatever. We know like what happens to our heart rate um, or our, our palms getting sweaty or something like that. And the, the function of positive emotions is to reduce threat. This, that threat response, that fight or flight or that stress response um, in our body. So it will actually activate the part of our nervous system that makes us feel calm. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times, it, for example, um, awe, for example, will activate our vagus nerve, which mm -hmm. gives us that sort of warm spreading feeling in our chest. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very different ex physiological experience than craving or mm -hmm. desire. So, so maybe let's take an example uh, for this room that we're sitting in tonight, where, where um, our online audience hopefully will go with me. We're sitting here in the Abbey Room. Yeah. Um, around the perimeter of the ceiling is from the 1890s, the artwork by Edward Abbey, which tells the story of the Holy Grail, um, the pursuit of quest, the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of wisdom. Um, you walk in, and for some of us, I think it's a moment of awe. Oh, this is this is beautiful. Mm -hmm. At some point, was a fire, a real fireplace here. Mm -hmm. um, is that an example of something that's that's potentially producing this different physiological reaction? Absolutely, and there are some challenges with modern life in actually accessing those emotions. Hmm. So I would say, absolutely yes. Like I could, I, when I first walked into this part of the library, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to cry. Right, because uh -huh. I am, because it, the, it was so novel having not been in a, in a place like this in a couple of years and everything that it, I was just so moved um, by it. But I've also worked really hard to be that open hearted mm -hmm. to these kinds of emotions. And I think that there's a lot working against us in our modern mm -hmm. lives that keeps us from being so open to feeling like I actually get chills just looking around, mm -hmm. right, yeah. to that. And the first thing is um, I, we just tend to be pretty numb, right, mm -hmm. to all of our emotions. We've been through so much, and, um, and it's so easy to not feel our feelings now. All we have to do is stay busy, right? Mm -hmm. We can just keep ourselves distracted mm -hmm. from our actual interior experience. Um, pretty easily now. We never really have to feel our feelings if we don't want to. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that you can't really selectively numb your emotions. You can't numb anxiety you feel about all the uncertainty in the world, for example, mm -hmm. and then feel uh, uh, moved emotionally when, by a painting or a room. So it's, it's kind of the contrast between being moved by a 19th century piece of art and that next pair of shoes that I didn't go and buy instead. And that that's, those are contrasting, <laughs> it contrasting is. pressures. They, yeah, right? they really are. Well, I just think that the sort of like constant stimulation, mm -hmm. it works against really being able to have a sensory experience right. that's gonna foster a sense of calm, a sense of relief from the stress that we're all under including, as you mentioned a moment ago, filling the entire day or filling the, your entire yes. life with distractions or just activities. Yeah, yeah, so, so here's my recipe. Oh, okay. My, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> um, let yourself feel what you feel, huh? right? So like taking a moment wherever you are, every day at least, to touch into something that you're feeling. And for most of us, um, it's not going to be like I, you're moved to tears by a mural in a beautiful room at first. Mm -hmm. Like before you can feel that, most of us need to feel sad, right? Mm -hmm. Or like a real deep sense of grief from what we've all been through. Mm -hmm. And just locating where that is, where, like where in your body do you feel that sadness? Just be curious about it. Lean into it, like 
what does it what does it really feel like to let your lived experience come through you? It's not going to hurt you. You can handle it, right? We tend to avoid think avoid our negative emotions because we think it, they'll never let up. But actually, what we know about the human nervous system is that when we suppress our emotions, not only are we suppressing other emotions, but our nervous system will tend to amplify the, the ones that were the negative ones. That it, they're they're sort of early warning systems, right? And so you know, our nervous system will amp them up a little bit to try and get us to feel. And when we just sort of lean into it, actually what we know is that human emotions can only, they only live in our bodies for less than 90 seconds. Um, now, I know we've all felt things for longer than 90 seconds. <laughs> this is because we think thoughts that then stimulate the emotion again and again. But if you can just stay with the emotion, you can you can kind of ride it like a wave. Know that it's gonna, gonna that it's gonna rise and crest and fall and recede in the same way that a wave would. So when we've both alluded to these last two years of the pandemic, um, this global phenomenon that it's like hasn't been seen since 1918, 1919, um, two years of um, of trauma, uh, mm -hmm. of, of loss, uh, in some cases of, of loved ones, in, in other cases of a way of life or uh, impact on, on us socially and yeah. economically. Um, so what, what, what does the science tell us we're to do with, with, those, with that experience? Um, is it a form of grieving that we must engage in? Is it a, you know, feeling whatever it is that we're feeling, like you mentioned a moment ago? Did, we'll, we'll walk us through. How, how, help, help us with this uh, experience. Yeah, it's just ongoing, too. That's the thing. You, in, in the introduction, you referred to this as post-pandemic. But literally 30 seconds before we started, I got a text from Fiona, the kid with the insight. She just tested positive for COVID, right? Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's just ongoing. She's having no symptoms. But it, it is, right. it's just this. So what we're dealing with is tremendous uncertainty about what comes next. And, um, and so what we can do is learn more effective strategies for coping with uncertainty than we come by naturally in terms of how we're kind of hardwired to deal with it. The opposite of uncertainty is not certainty, right? We tend to pursue certainty when we feel uncertain. We want to know the black or white answer to what's coming next. And the opposite of uncertainty is presence, right? It is being present to whatever is there for us. So for many, if not most of us, a really profound grief for what we've lost. Mm. Um, there might also be excitement about what's coming too. Who knows, right? Like whatever is there, but just being present to right. um, what we feel. And then developing skills besides searching for certainty, because that just doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I hope she's going to be fine, right? So. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but to be more precise, we're, we're in, you know, post this phase of the pandemic as opposed to the whole pandemic being over. Although, you know, here in Boston, uh, clearly the mask mandate became either, uh, you know, just a recommendation uh, last Saturday. So as a city, I think we're, we're still trying to work out what, is, what does this mean for behavior that many of us have engaged in over the last, over the last year. Um, but it is this, we're not done, we are done, we're emotionally done, but we're not done with the science because uh, we still have a number of you know, people that test positive on a daily basis. Um, so that's different, that's a new level of uncertainty. Yes. Um, new level I, of uncertainty. It is, and I, and I would say globally, I mean, it's just one thing after the next, right, right? in terms of um, human suffering and mm -hmm. um, not knowing really what what comes next right. for for people. So, shall we talk about some strategies? Yes, <laughs> please. Be, yes, I'm just going to yes, leave yes, you yes, with yes. that. It's just going to be one thing after the next. 
just kidding. A recipe <laughs> strategy. To, well, I mean, yeah. you know, I wrote, I wrote down five, like, I, what I think are major traumas affecting us as a species right now. Um, oh, we just talked about one. Yeah. Um, um, the Ukraine situation yeah. and the, you know, the nuclear dimension uh, possibility, which mm -hmm. for, for those of us who grew up in the 80s or earlier are used to living with, uh, with some notion of global threat from the nuclear front that we haven't seen in a few decades, that's returned. Um, the racial reckoning that we as a society in the US have been um, grappling anew with, it's not new, but we've been grappling anew with it for the last 18 months or so, largely in light of the um, George Floyd and other, um, yeah. other killings. Um, we have political divisiveness at a level that we, we haven't, I'm just gonna do the laundry list and then I'm gonna stop, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna not. dwell on all of this, but I, I think part of, our <laughs> work, part of our work is to acknowledge what's affecting right, us, exactly. so that's one of the strategies. So, so COVID, Ukraine, political divisiveness, racial reckoning, and climate change and global uncertainty. So, so yes, please share some <laughs> strategies. Um, we are really uh, not delivering on the happiness angle. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah, no, some, some, I, you know, I, my number one go-to strategy um, is to not believe everything I think. Mm. Right. So in the face, so as humans, we our brains are he, giant prediction machines, and when we enter uh, periods of really, really rapidly accelerated change, mm. uh, you know, we start making all kinds of predictions. We're looking for certainty in our thoughts, and um, at least for us, and I would venture for for everyone in this room and probably everybody watching online, we've really been trained to value our thoughts, um, our analysis of the world, to really believe in our own rightness of mm -hmm. the way that we're thinking. And, and actually, there's a, just a lot that we don't know and can't know. And when we think thoughts about the future that are very stressful for us, mm -hmm. They may or may not be true. There's no way of knowing whether or not our predictions are right or will become right at some point. But our brain doesn't know that. And so it reacts as if the threat were real, if, as if it were happening to us. So it's one thing to feel a sense of vicarious distress at um, what's happening from other human, to other human beings in the Ukraine for example. Yeah. Um, and those feelings are, are real. It's another thing to believe really stressful thoughts about what will happen to us mm -hmm. and, um, you know, all down the line there. So Absolutely. to just watch what our thoughts are doing, what kind of emotional experience mm -hmm. our, our thoughts are creating for us. Do you think that's, that's behind why we all became amateur epidemiologists over the last two years, or why <laughs> yes. we all you know, be became public health experts sitting on our, in our couches at home, uh, surfing the internet, uh, whereas what you're saying is don't believe everything that you think you know, even if, if you're uh, doing the research? Yeah, I, I would watch more for sort of the ruminating type of thoughts, right? It's one mm. thing to be curious about what's going on and to try and be really well-informed and to try and understand the world. It's another thing to look for certainty in our thoughts. Mm. And, uh, you know, so we can sort of see how there are, okay, well, I'll tell a story on myself. At the beginning of the shutdown, I had, um, so I had just launched my last book, The New Adolescence, and um, ironically about helping kids through uncertainty and anxiety, oh, right? Good. I had no idea um, what was coming. And my whole book tour and everything was canceled. And um, we hadn't moved to online speaking engagements. And so I didn't know what was going to happen there, and all my in-person coaching clients, and didn't, that I was, that we weren't doing that anymore either, so we were trying to move to the phone, and I just didn't, there was a tremendous amount of uncertainty about what was actually going to happen. Hmm. And so, when one of my friends uh, said, oh, I just talked to a psychic, 
I was like, oh, I want to talk to her too. I'm a PhD, I'm a scientist, right? Like, you know, suddenly I'm like asking my teenage daughters, hey, read me my horoscope, right? You know, like all, like we look for, mm. for certainty outside of ourselves in sort of black and white ways of thinking. And, mm. um, and so I would just say, be really beware of, looking out outside of your own experience, of looking towards your thoughts about the future and your predictions, if those thoughts are causing you a lot of stress and rumination. Watch what's happening and remind yourself, you don't really know what's true or not. Like we aren't going to know the future. Um, we can know a lot of things about the present, and that's where we can find uh, comfort, and that's where we can decide what our next best step is, how to help, okay. right? So that's strategy number one. Be, be careful what you're, what you're thinking, right? Yeah, okay. yes. Don't believe everything you think. Don't believe everything. Yeah. Um, I was reading one piece about seven ways to cope with uncertainty <laughs> that you wrote. There we go. Um, He's this got was all the one ways. of them. He's hmm? got the recipe. <laughs> I shall bake a cake with this later for human life. Um, um, I'm, I'm, and we, you, we can, we'll share the link with those of you uh, uh, watching online and make it available for those in person. Um, but uh, finding healthy comfort items was another, uh, another point in here. I'm not going to go through all seven, but... but uh, yeah, no, I think it's really important to recognize that uncertainty, the human brain perceives uncertainty as a threat. Right? It's a stressful experience um, for us to, and, and that's evolutionary, right? That it, uh, back in the day, if you didn't know uh, where your next source of food or water, or there was, it, you were unable to predict in your environment, there, there, was a, there was a threat to your existence probably. And, um, and so you would have a, a a fight or flight type of response to that. And to know that the, what we feel is a desire for certainty is actually a, a, dry, a very human drive, much like the drive towards food or water or social relationships with each other. And so um, when we're under stress, we tend to try and comfort ourselves and our brain is gonna push us towards any old, dopamine inducing comfort items, macaroni and cheese. We knew like from the, um, from the like day drinking memes, like all the moms putting Chardonnay in their cereal at breakfast, right? In the very beginning of the pandemic, like, that is not a healthy comfort item, you know, but that's what we try and do. And so for you, preemptively comforting yourself in a way that is is going to be comforting over the long term that isn't going to leave uh, you feeling more depleted. We, you know, we need to know what those things are for ourselves and kind of have a playlist of them and then give yourself permission. I think that this is the world we're living in for the foreseeable future, right? So we need to preemptively comfort ourselves so that we don't deplete ourselves just trying to cope with the world we're living in. Where does binging on TV shows or reality shows fall on the spectrum? Of not that? healthy. Not, not healthy. Not healthy. <laughs> no, it's a numbing tactic. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I yeah. watch TV. Don't yeah. worry. But, well, yeah, like, moderation is another key factor. Yeah, on, it's on some of this, it's right? yeah, it's watching for the sort of escalating dopamine effect, right? The more yeah. um, the more pleasure you seek the more anxious we tend to feel. Okay. Like that that um, pleasure and pain or what we're, we tend to experience as more like anxiety, mm -hmm. it needs to be in balance with each mm -hmm. other. And so when you push the ple pleasure um, lever, mm -hmm. it's like a seesaw and your brain will push, the, push it back and, and flood you with mm -hmm. essentially anxiety inducing um, chemicals. So I'm going to ask you about one more that I'm personally drawn to, and then we'll start to take a few questions from both our in-person audience and our online audience as well. Um, 
finding meaning in the chaos. That's that's yeah. the one that I, I, I'm drawn to personally. And uh, so I'm just, would you tell us a little bit more about, about what that what that means? Yeah, well, it was the insight that Fiona had when she was yeah. eight, right? That if you can find some meaning in all of the difficulty, that will carry you through. So how can you, essentially, how, how can you use your unique interests and your unique skills to um, help people mm -hmm. that are suffering? And sometimes, you know, all you need to find meaning in a very difficult situation is to show up and be a witness to what's actually happening, right? All trauma needs a witness and that's what so many people right now need. People feel so alone. Right now, one third of the global adult population is struggling with pretty serious loneliness, symptoms of loneliness and isolation. And um, I, I think like, so it can be very meaningful to just be present to what somebody else is experiencing. Not to fix it for them, um, not to try and make them happy, but just to be a witness to what's actually happening. Good, thank you. Any, uh, please raise your hand and uh, Jana will come to you with a microphone. Or if uh, there's an online question, we can take it via uh, Kristen. Kristen, would you like to pick one to start with? Thank you, and thank you for that conversation. Um, Randolph asks, do you have any examples of people who have creatively found more joy and meaning in the middle of the pandemic? So specific examples of other people. Who found, certainly people who found a lot of meaning, right? Hmm. And, um, you know, I, I can just look in my own, in my own life to their, there are, of course, lots of joyful um, moments in the sort of relief um, experience of it. So uh, examples of people who found more meaning would be, you know, my colleagues at the Greater Good Science Center have found a, a real thread of um, you know, stories to report on that of not just people finding joy and meaning, but like ways to actually help other people um, in all of this. I mean, I, I, I feel like I look around and virtually everyone around me has, the people, humans are very resilient. And one of the ways that we are resilient is um, by looking beyond ourselves. Um, and I think any specific example can probably go either way. It can either be filling the need without necessarily taking us to meaning, or it can be a meaningful experience. I'm just thinking of, um, well, in our own experience, we got a, we got a puppy um, yes. early on. Totally. Um, we'd already decided it was time for another dog, so uh, I'm giving myself a pass on the uh, pandemic puppy solution. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is a, another moment of joy in our lives yeah, and uh, for we're sure. able to share with, with others as well. So. Although, although that can, I think you can take that to an extreme as well. For sure you can take it to an extreme, but I think that a lot of us came back to more simple joys uh, yeah. um, from, than from like the sort of more elaborate desires and wants that we had. So um, my kids, who mind you, do not live at home anymore, uh, convinced me, I'll one-up you. We got the pandemic puppy and we got nine chickens. <laughs> 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 right. Not eight, that not I ten, now am the sole caregiver for because they went back to their um, lives. But I have to tell you, in my life of, you know, 10 Zoom meetings a day, mm -hmm. and in between almost every meeting, mean, meeting on Zoom, I will walk outside and see if the chickens have laid any eggs, and which is, but there's only four left. It's been sort of <laughs> a bloodbath. Um, but the four that we have that seem to be surviving are, um, they lay, one of the things I didn't know is that chickens lay eggs on a variable schedule. So it's like this jackpot uh, sometimes, right? Like you never know. I can't go out every morning. There's no routine that there will, there will be eggs. And so this sort of simple act of, looking for eggs gets me outside, 
uh, even if it's raining, right? Like there's this sort of pull to this much simpler existence, mm -hmm. which um, maybe is a tiny, it's just like a tiny sliver in my life. I wouldn't say my life is that simple, but, uh, but it's that pull towards that simple everyday joy of a pet, right? That, or a, an idea of an urban farm. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, n n not to diminish any of the trauma or loss, no. but that this is a possibly a silver lining that the, the the seeking out of the simpler joys. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I think that um, if we learned anything from Viktor Frankl, for example, sure. right? Silver linings are a very real thing. We don't need to feel guilty for finding meaning or joy in the face of very real trauma, right? Toxic positivity is denying the trauma and difficulty and pretending that we just feel all happy about it. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what we're recommending. But a, a very good coping strategy is to, f to find the silver lining mm -hmm. while still acknowledging the devastation or the grief or the difficulty that we're facing. Yeah, his work uh, published as Man's Search for Meaning, mm -hmm. we maybe would call it the human search for meaning now, yeah. but I think as uh, uh, early 20th century, really, really insightful really work important. in the face of trauma such as um, the Holocaust and other, other mm -hmm. tragic events of the early 20th yeah. century. Um, one more question from the I'm audience. I'm take my Go mask ahead. off so I can hopefully be heard over the microphone. This has been super interesting. It's great to have you here, Dr. Carter. So I've been hearing, like I'm sure most people here have as well, a lot about uh, purpose-driven lives and as you've been describing this evening, trying to identify more meaning. But I, I feel like there's certain stages of life when you have more capacity to, to do that kind of thinking and then actually execute on your ideas. I'm just remembering myself when I was younger and you know, quite busy with family and work and this and that. Uh, and do you feel that there might just be an opportunity for more anxiety because people are hearing all these wonderful ideas but not feeling that they have the capacity in their lives to figure out what is that larger purpose or how do I really find meaning? Yeah, to that, I, yeah, for sure. And I wouldn't I certainly wouldn't want anybody to come away with greater anxiety that they're not doing it right, right? That they're, you know, that, that and I do think that um, one of the beautiful things about middle age is that it does expand your capacity, like just having lived experience um, can expand your capacity to f think about these things and busyness, the busyness of being in other life stages also can prevent, uh, can keep us from our interior. So I agree with everything you're saying, and I would say presence is available to all of us all the time. That the, the, that's all we're really suggesting is that you be present to your own experience. Mm -hmm. Whatever your experience is, is the experience you're having and bringing some curiosity to that and, it, and a real deep acceptance of whatever is happening for you in the present moment, whether you've got a bunch of little kids and, and anxiety about all the things that are happening in the world, just being present to that will uh, provide, provide you with some relief, basically, from being too far in the future. So no pressure to find a greater sense of meaning, but I would pay attention to what you care about, what matters to you, what, how can you comfort your particular self in a way that's healthy for you? It's okay to do that. It's important to do that. There is probably a more natural openness to being more present um, at different ages of, of, of life. Um, but the, I think it's perhaps it's society sets up certain ages to not have capacity at all because you're off yeah. to college, you're into the workforce, you're so busy with raising young kids or whatever it is. So I don't know that it's it's necessarily a feature of age per se, uh, but 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 certainly the the index of when does one have capacity is a, is a good insight. And what do we allow 
right? We see busyness as a sign of value and importance. And so we sort of push people towards the sort of crazy busy mentality that takes us away from our own lived exp and felt experience. Which, which can be, in, in my experience, a great, a great way to just exercise the denial stage of yes. coping with, yes. uh, with trauma or loss or grief. Absolutely. Because I'm filling up my life, so I don't have time to worry about these pesky emotions or, or, other, uh, or other things. So. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, I, um, I work with a lot of people in their 20s and 30s and who have little kids, and um, I just turned 50. And one of them said to me, in a group on Zoom. We can't really, we've been talking about it, and we can't really understand why you're so pro old age. And I thought, old age? <laughs> what are you talking about? And he said, well, you know, you're so happy about being 50. And to me, I'm like, that doesn't actually seem that old, honestly. And, and he said, were your 20s and 30s really hard? Did you just, were you miserable in your younger? And I'm like, no, it wasn't at all. I, was, I really loved my 20s and my 30s. I've loved all of the ages, but I would never go back, right? Just because of the debt, the history I have with other humans and the connections that time and lived experience is incredibly valuable so much more valuable than smooth skin. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, th th thank you for that, that insight. Um, Kristen, and then we'll take the second audience. So Question. to dovetail on that, what about people who fit outside of societal norms? So they're single, they don't have any kids. How should people find meaning and happiness who are in that situation? Yeah, I think that um, anybody who feels like an outsider in any way, um, that, that can be a very painful experience. And to meet yourself where you are with this, the, the advice also um, applies, right? So let yourself feel how you're actually feeling. And then see if you can give somebody else what you're looking for yourself, right? So if you're looking for connection, one of the things that I recommend is to think about a time in your life where you, somebody did something for you that you feel grateful for or that you appreciated and maybe you never properly thanked them. It could have been a long time ago um, or it could have been yesterday. And to just write them a note, right? It, to just extend yourself a little bit to just say thank you, that I appreciated this. Um, if you can deliver it in person or live in some way virtually to read it to them so that you can actually experience that connection with them, it can be tremendously powerful. One of the things about expressing gratitude is that it really dramatically increases our sense of self-worth <laughs> because when we acknowledge that somebody else has incurred a cost um, for us, we're basically unconsciously acknowledging that we must be worth something because people don't do that if, if they're not. And so like when we feel like we are outsiders, that's a very particular form of, can be a very particular form of loneliness. And so to remember that our connections to others can be helpful. It was interesting during the early stages of uh, the pandemic where um, people were not able to gather in person, but were choosing these Zoom breaks or Zoom family gatherings or after hours on a, on a Friday to do, to do a Zoom cocktail. Yeah. Did, did those work? Did you, did you what, what's, what's your sense of, uh, of that? You know, it's fun. At least for me personally, it really reminded me of my connections to people that I had fallen out of touch with because mm. it made it possible to be connected to people who aren't in your everyday physical presence. Yeah. And so I had uh, nine college roommates my senior year in college, and I mean, I wasn't in touch with really any of them. And somebody started a text thread and a series of Zoom meetings, oh. and now I'm, I am in touch with them all, right? right? Like I could tell you about what is happening. And that sort of history and connection, it's a shot, it's, 
it, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, just, it's a shallow connection in sure. some ways, but it's also, it's also a way of remembering, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have this shared history, mm -hmm. we are connected, and actually I very much care mm -hmm. about them, mm -hmm. you know? Thank you so, for sharing that. First, thank you for being here and sharing your insights. Uh, you know, I will say I'm married to a wonderful woman. I have great friends, and we find meaning in sharing just everyday experiences. It doesn't have yeah. to be climbing a mountain. We just like experiences together, whether it's family and friends. And you know, I think we find that balance for meaningfulness. But I'd like some insights into another issue, which is you know dealing with let's say resistant like elderly type parents, where they're expressing because of COVID or the elderliness that they're lonely and yet they won't move into a plan unit development next to them or they're ill or one of the two might be ill but they're resistant to getting a helper and all you can do is you know try not to spin you know every family member spin and say do you force them out what do you want to do with them you know these are not incompetent people where you're going to force it out but how do you try and remain calm while you would do it different or you know they you know what i'm saying yeah you can't just take over their life no you know? it'd be so much easier if we could right but assuming yeah. <laughs> but since we but since we can't right you know what is a way to just address that other than just watching you know a degradation or you know the situation there you know how do you just address it with them do you just leave them yeah. be and let them experience no. it what's the no. best kind of way to do it so you've raised a really interesting thing which is resistance and um you know we are taught to resist and um and it, when we're resisting reality it's a little like when it's raining and we go outside and shout at the sky right? Uh, it's not really going to change the reality. Resistance in general creates a lot of stress. And so what you're describing is that you're resisting resistance. Like there's a double stress that comes um, from that. So you can practice acceptance. Acceptance is not the same as resignation, right? We accept things, we accept reality and the reality of other people's emotions, especially, um, in the present, we don't accept that it's never gonna change, right? We don't accept an unknown future, that's resignation, right? I, just bringing a real acceptance and with it a curiosity to their experience so that they don't have to resist so much. Um, they, they sense my my guess, because I am psychic, is that they are resisting your great ideas, <laughs> right? And so to, instead of bringing great ideas, first bringing a real acceptance about what they're afraid of, right? Like really, really finding a place of deep empathy and compassion for their fear. And once they, tr once you build, rebuild trust around that, that you're not gonna try and fix their fear mm -hmm. and um, that you don't have an agenda, that, that you can just help them label their emotions essentially, then you will have, a, have firmer ground to, take, to let them decide what the next best step forward is. She was right. <laughs> Just listen to her. Yeah, you don't need me, buddy. You got your wife. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll move to the online question. Take another one from online. Kristen, thanks. Thanks. Carrie asks, how does humor fit into our coping skills? Humor. How does humor? Oh, the best coping mechanism ever. If we can access a sense of humor about difficulty, if we can allow ourselves that, particular joy, I think that, that it's the best possible uh, coping mechanism that there is. And I feel like, like things have been so bad, a lot of times we feel anxious about making fun, right? Mm -hmm. Or y using humor as a coping strategy. Like, it's not funny. It's just not. And um, while that's true, I think we're also depriving of ourselves of just basically an evolutionary 
skill, a way of bringing lightness into the, into the dark and that we need to give ourselves permission to not have ha happiness anxiety, right? That like to feel like if, if we have a moment of joy or happiness in the midst of something really difficult and something that is truly awful, that um, the other shoe isn't gonna drop or that we aren't gonna be punished somehow for not recognizing the true horror in it. Like we as humans are most resilient and most high functioning and best able to help other people, and best able to connect with others when we let there be a balance, right? We need both. We can't live in the dark all the time just as we can't live in the light all the time. We need both experiences very much. And so to the extent that we can access our own sense of humor, seek out the people who make us laugh, just be near people who don't feel afraid to laugh, who just are willing to guffaw out loud, um, to let ourselves be teased a little bit. You guys are good at it, right? But, but in, in your in your own in your books, um, you know, you're you're allowing us to laugh with you at situations that you're <laughs> sharing, uh, yeah. which I think is, is a beautiful gift to, to, to share with the world. Um, there was one story about I think it was um, was it a bullying situation where um, one of the children was accused of bullying by a by a neighbor. Uh, I forget what the exact uh, story was about, but. Um, you were just able to walk us through what you were experiencing and the embarrassment and the relief and then being able to deal with it. So um, there are many stories like that in, in, in your books that, uh, you know, it's self-effacing, self but in some cases humorous and joyful as well. Yeah, I am not afraid. For me, I feel like I've finally processed a difficult situation if I can make fun of my initial reaction to it, which is never very skillful, it turns out, <laughs> right? So using that hindsight, yeah. I think, can to laugh at ourselves, to laugh at, like, look at what we, look at what our initial reaction to some of these things is like that happens to be a very human response mm. both the like we don't react well a lot of the time and that's okay because we get to try again yeah. you know um the the flip side of the coin to uncertainty is i think helplessness so in the face of covid or right. the invasion of ukraine or something as vast as climate change. It's the, the, the sense of helplessness yeah. that is, is another piece of this that's difficult to deal with. Is that just another form of uncertainty or, or is there a different dimension no, to dealing I, with that? I actually think that there is a different dimension to learned helplessness. That is sort of a belief about the future. It's a resignation, right? Mm. It's a, um, it's, it's a, it's not the kind of form of acceptance that we're really talking about. And uh, as humans, as with any mammal, it turns out, like the moment that we believe we have totally lost agency in the world and in our own lives, it, that's a real moment of doom for us. And so while it's natural to believe that we don't have agency in some of these situations that are so much bigger than ourselves, we of course always do, right? We always do have some agency. There is always something that we can, um, we can do to help others. I actually think that the first step is always to model the behavior that, um, or the, you know, what we're going for, the, the sort of healthy comfort thing to start with ourselves first. So we become truly helpless in terms of our ability to help the world when we're so impaired ourselves, when we're so burned out or exhausted or traumatized, right? So the first step is always actually not to look at Ukraine, but to look at where, where am I right now? How can I live it to give it, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it can feel like such a big disconnect, mm -hmm. right? It can feel so much easier sometimes to just feel helpless and despair about. Mm -hmm. And I think the despair part is totally okay. Mm -hmm. It's the helpless part that really gets us into trouble when we start to assume that we have 
no control. We always have control over some aspect of our existence. Maybe it's only our thoughts, but. Well, I think even early in the pandemic, you know, uh, well, maybe two years, we were all sort of um, running out of patience by, by the two year mark, but early on it was like, okay, I can go home, I can wear a mask, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, oh, now I can go get tested. So each, each progressive step, adds a thing I can do, so it minimizes the level of, of helplessness that otherwise you'd feel correct. Not a researcher, I can't go to a lab and make a vaccine or something like that, but these are things in my own world that I can do, and so I think that's another example of what you're saying. It's yeah. what, what is in, a, in our sphere uh, of control that we Where can do make we have life agent? better. Yeah. Where, Where do we, have we actually have agency? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, any more questions before we draw this part of the program to our to a close. Maybe we'll take one more in person and one more online. Uh, thank you for tonight. It's beautiful to be here in this room. But say uh, the things that you had said, um, you know, what I, you know, like being present, being witness, or even like the people that you did research for this book about happiness, was it a certain, uh, like your daughter was insightful, she's resilient, you know, it, it isn't all about being happiness, but like the things that you had said were kind of like uh, a faith-based approach, you know, of being present. Did you find that, like in your research, that the people were, that were most happy had great faith or were yogis or, I was curious what type yeah. of... Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I feel like the, that so much of my work has been the science of the blazingly obvious. Right, that like these are things that my grandmother knew, and these are things that the Buddhists have been teaching for t thousands of years, and the, that there is, you know, um, there has been all along, you know, in the last 25 years that I'm doing this research, um, I I feel like so often I come upon a scientific insight um, and think. Well, we knew that, <laughs> you know, right? But now we just have proof of what's happening in the brain. But there is the, the wisdom traditions um, definitely came before the science on a lot of this. And now we have science that backs up a lot of it. And of course, there are new insights as well. Yeah. Thank you. We'll take a question online. How can positive empathy infuse college students studying online from home during our present coronavirus pan pandemic while surrounded by their family instead of their would-be college campus peer classmates and peer college classmates? Can you repeat the first part of that? It's how can positive empathy infuse college students studying online from home? Yeah, so, you know, I, I would just say empathy and not necessarily positive empathy. Right, so a lot of the time when we're like, it, so if you're alone, you're studying at home alone and uh, empathy can provide a real source of connection to other people. To just witness other people's experiences is really powerful and can provide that, um, that, that connection and improve our experience in that way. When we say positive empathy, I don't really know what that means, right? Like that, could, that to me, um, the risk there is that it could be interpreted as I'm willing to empathize with you if you're having a positive emotion, right? Like I, I and that if if what that means is a little bit like vicarious joy, which is a real thing, and we should all jump on that, but. What I, what I also think ultimately that is positive for our experience can be, now it isn't always, but it can be a form of empathy no matter what other people are experiencing, even if that's a hard thing. I, wouldn't, I would say compassion is that form of, of empathy. So, so compassion is acknowledging that somebody else is suffering and then feeling a sense of agency in your ability to relieve some of that suffering, even if it's just by being a witness. Well, I'm going to um, take the moderator's privilege and uh, 
close out with one final question. So much of your work is on how to talk to kids, how to talk to teenagers. So I'm just wondering, in light of all of these big challenges, you know, and particularly with the, both the academic, but more particularly the social and emotional learning loss that has, has occurred for our, for, our, for our kids, whether they're our own kids, people we teach, people we see in the library, um, people in our extended family, what, what, would your, what would your advice be to all of us working with young people to help them get through these next months, this next period? I, my advice is to, so first of all, I believe that, that this generation will get caught up, right? Their children are enormously resilient mm -hmm. and there are some deficiencies now that, 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 that we can help resolve with through face-to-face -face contact, through helping them with their social skills. And I think the thing that a lot of kids need mm -hmm. is um, help facing their fear in a mm -hmm. way that, that they've become socially avoidant because they're afraid of, of the deficiency that they may or may not have developed. And um, when, we, when we avoid something, um, our, we sort of feel, even thinking about avoiding something provides us with a sense of relief from our fear. Mm -hmm. and, but then it becomes very quickly a full-blown phobia, right? That like we start having bigger and bigger stress responses, or kids start having bigger and bigger stress responses to smaller and smaller response. And so we just want to help expose them to other people. Mm -hmm. And I think in our everyday life, no matter where, where you are, you, you know, just making eye contact with other people makes a big difference, especially kids. Saying hello, right? Asking people how, how they are. Not being on your phone when you're checking out at the grocery store, for example, right? Like making eye contact with other humans can really help us all recover from this period of prolonged isolation. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'll have a closing word in a moment, but first, please thank Dr. Christine Carter for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your great questions. And so, once again, thank you all for joining us here in person or online this evening. Um, next in this series, we will have our guest, Dr. Angela O, oh, two weeks from tonight, March 21st, and we'll follow the same format. Um, she is a Buddhist priest, a high-profile attorney, and works on racial relations in communities, so uh, proves to be an interesting, interesting conversation as well. On May 2nd, we will have uh, John Jacobs, one of the founders of The Good Life Company, and then we will round out the series with the um, uh, yeah, renowned uh, journalist and, and author, Dr. Eddie Gloud, Jr., on uh, the current situation in, in America. So please join us either in person or online, or check out the recordings after the fact. Um, and all of this brought to you by the Boston Public Library, the Lowell Institute, and tonight in particular, the GBH Forum Network. Thank you for being with us. Until next time, Please be well, please be safe.